If people are saying we are, then I would take it as a compliment, but I would never say that of myself. I mean, let's say we, we still think we're better than a lot of our competitors, of course. No, I mean, you have to believe in yourself as well. Hi, and welcome to the newest episode of not only Herbcast podcast, but also the Landscape Architecture series, which is a series I created a couple of months ago, which is dedicated to discussions with landscape architects. And so far, I've been discussing only with landscape architects working in Denmark, but I thought it's uh, time to expand and also to talk about landscape architecture from perspective of people from different countries. And today we will be having uh, a discussion with Cees van der Wieken, who is the founding partner and senior landscape architect at Lola Landscape, which is an office based in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And I'm very, very excited that I could have this conversation with Case, observe and get to know what's the Dutch perspective and Dutch approach to landscape architecture. Today we focus on the history of Lola as a, as a practice and how the approach of Lola differs from different offices in the Netherlands, but also in different countries. What's the ambition of Lola? How can they strive to be the best office possible? What's the influence of Rotterdam on Lola's and Kay's work? What's their design and uh, research philosophy? And also overall, What's the role of landscape architecture in urban development? And we end with some advice from case to young landscape architects. Welcome to the newest episode. Hi again. Yeah, hi again, indeed. In so. a way. <laughs> the story is that we recorded this episode already, but online. And there were some, some problems with the sound. Some acoustic challenges. Some acoustic challenges. But what are the odds? I happen to be in Rotterdam. I'm here as a part of the Urban Future Conference. And I realized that Lola Landscape is located in Rotterdam. So I added one plus one and it was two. So it meant that it would be great if we could meet physically. And uh, indeed, we are in Lola's office, which I enjoy a lot. There is a lot of food, a lot of plants. And we'll talk about, about the plants in a minute. But maybe before we start, you know, this is part of the landscape series where I talk about the landscape architecture offices, especially I want to talk to founders, CEOs, or head of landscape departments in different offices to get their, uh, their own perspective on the development of the discipline and they somehow story to the top from zero to hero. I think it would be great to start with a brief history of Lola. I know already because I did the research before that you started with the Europan, but it would be great if you could say something more about that. Sure, yeah. Welcome to host you and your listeners to our office here in, uh, in Rotterdam. For us, it was also the place where it started, in a way, because this is where we wanted to go to when we decided to have an office together. So before we won the Europe on, there was a little bit of a story before that, that actually we studied together, the three of us, Eric and me, in Wageningen, which we found was super interesting, but at the same time, also a bit a dormant little city. And we wanted to be part of the, the designer scene that we saw in Rotterdam, which is at the time actually, yeah, one of the creative hubs, I think, in architecture. It was a bit the time of the Super Dutch, and we were very much admiring that, and we wanted to be part of it with the landscape office. And we already, from the start, wanted to have our own. We also had this kind of ambition of to be like the best office in the world. Like we had this sort of moonshot goal for ourselves to do that. And I think we're still trying to be that, you know, like we're trying always to improve. Uh, but indeed, one of the first things we did was try to find interesting competitions, also to actually try to find work. And around the same time, both things happened. We landed the first project in Dordrecht, which is a city close to Rotterdam. And we amazingly won the Rotterdam in collaboration with the Rotterdam office, architecture office. And we were both like uh, super young still. So it was like, uh, it felt like an amazing trip. And we actually went for sites that we found interesting rather than we thought, okay, that has the, had the best market condition or whatever. So we, in the end, found a beautiful site in uh, Sintra in Portugal. And then we won. And then the first thing we did is to 
get into a crash course Portuguese. We went there a couple of times. We had actually a lot of meetings with the urban department. And then the credit crisis hit and the whole project got kind of shelved in a way from their side. But it was our first taste of this, uh, let's say, European uh, vibe. I think also the, the, the promise we had back then already, I'm talking about, let's say, 2006 when we started, which is already some time ago. But then we also felt like, uh, yeah, Europe is at our feet or we should look beyond the Netherlands and uh, be uh, having an international scope. So I think also the city of Rotterdam kind of did that to us as well, that all the offices here had international staff and they also worked uh, in, in, for instance, the south of uh, Europe, but also uh, Russia, for instance, or the North Europe. And offices, for instance, like West Aid, which was a bit of an example to us as well, that they, they also had a lot of stuff going on in, in, in America. So... I don't know, that to us is kind of almost normal, but I realize that that's not from every country in Europe or worldwide where you're from that you're like, hey, let's just to do a project in another continent. That's how it kind of started for us. And we gradually grew. For a long time, we were just the three of us. Then some interns came and then we wanted to have the first staff. And we also tried to get really from smaller to bigger projects. And even though we already wanted to have like 25 people in our office in five years, you know, that was a bit too ambitious, but we, we managed that in like eight to 10 years. So I, in a way, in, you know, kind of linked maybe to the theme of how you described it. It's also that I think it's good to set those goals far away enough that you can have something to reach for, but also that they are within realistic boundaries also. I still think that to be the best office in the world is a realistic thing, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I also know that uh, there's a lot of great other offices out there. So it's, it's good to kind of have a healthy ambition to that, to the end. It's amazing to have the best office in the world in the podcast. Uh, <laughs> and of course, I, I think that you, you have to have very high ambition. And then if you, if you don't manage to achieve that thing, you probably land with something spectacular anyways, uh, which is maybe below the, the initial aim or idea, but, but, but still creating something, something great. What was the, the thing that shaped you the most? Was that the, the city of, of Rotterdam, when, where, where you opened your office or where you currently operate? Was that uh, the Dutch approach to planning itself or, or, or was that maybe something else? Yeah, good question. Um, I do think that the city of Rotterdam helped a lot in different ways because it was also not a city where at the time, there was a lot of work for landscape architects. We felt there was a lot to do. There was a lot of things wrong or under, uh, let's say, was sort of underachieving, especially in the green uh, strategies. But it was also that we felt it was a city where you were forced to kind of find markets outside of the Netherlands to have an international scope. So I think in that sense, it also helped. Like a bit simplistic, but maybe I think a lot of the Amsterdam market stayed quite stable during also the difficult times. And the offices there, they were kind of having enough work around themselves. Even though they were also struggling, they were still building stuff. Also with architecture, you saw that. So I think always been a little bit more, let's say, comfort focused. So they were like, oh, I'm just making a good living. I'm making nice buildings. Uh, I can uh, bike to all my projects. I also like that if you have that. but. I think they have a bit less an adventure spirit than I think the Rotterdam uh, officers have. Rotterdam is also kind of a city for people who like to work hard and play hard, and party hard. It, it, is, it has a bit of the Berlin vibe in a way, even though I think, you know, it's, it's a smaller city. And at the moment also, it's, it's very much booming. So I'm talking really like 10, 15 years ago when most people did the university study, then the, the Rotterdam was not the first city on the list to relocate to. They would rather go to Amsterdam and Utrecht uh, or The Hague. And now it really is like the place to be in, in the Netherlands, I think. And it's kind of difficult to say because I live here, but that's, I think, the situation. I also feel a big part of it was also our joint chemistry with the three of us, having a bit of a crazy idea to start an office while it was not the easiest path to follow. So there was also a determination in that and a bit of naivety, I think, also that you... We were at the time also prepared to kind of like suffer a little bit for it by making long hours and not making a lot of money, but kind of understanding, yeah, but I have a bigger purpose for that. And that's had to, to get somewhere to have this vague idea of, yeah, have, having an office of 25 people staff and doing international projects, competing with the big names. That was sort of the idea we started with, which also meant for us the research 
let's say, freedom that we had. Or let's put it this way, that, that we felt like, yeah, you can do certain projects for commercial projects, so to say, that you could do when you were having, we were actually staffed for somebody else. And then you just had to accept them. And now we felt like, yeah, now we can just say, no, we don't want to do that. We want to, we're, hey, we're interested in, uh, in from these, this or this project, we see a bigger phenomenon appearing. Let's do research about this. So that's how we, for instance, did a research about how a lot of times parks are planned in the, let's say, the verges of uh, urban planning, where all the shitty stuff ends up. Like, for instance, uh, where all the electricity masts are standing. Like, okay, we can build houses here. Let's make a park there. So then we said, hey, this is happening in more places. Let's research that and let's maybe write an article on it or make a, make a publication on it. So I think it helped us also to form ourselves intellectually a little bit and having a, developing a story for, for ourselves, which is still something that we cling on to. But on top of that, we've done so much, so many other things, but it was really a great way to start like kind of a playground for yourself you could say you've mentioned already that uh, you are the best office and uh, i was wondering what's so special about lola lola means lost landscapes and you also say that the research is playing a, a big part in the office so what's so specific about that because of course there should be i think there should be research behind every every project that, that is being done right especially in our field i think i would like to develop the, the thread of this uniqueness of of your office of what you do I think it's still the ambition to be the best one. It, <laughs> if people are saying we are, then I would take it as a compliment, <laughs> but I would never say that of myself. I mean, let's say we, we still think we're better than a lot of our competitors, of course. No, I mean, you have to believe in yourself as well. But we take a lot of pride in, in making really uh, nice drawings, nice graphics, but that's in a way a bit um, uh, sort of the, the overall idea of quality, I think, that you can find important or not. So we are not always, in that sense, the most efficient office. And that also relates to the research uh, component in a lot of our projects. I think it's also how we started out. There was also a very practical reason for it. Like when we were a very young office, that nobody was trusting us with very big building projects, which at the time were also not really available. So we had to compete with those projects with more established firms, like, for instance, West State. And then uh, Arjan Geus would just walk in and he would just uh, make everybody, uh, let's say, want him in his, in his, uh, his office to do the, to the project. So that was when we were younger, was like, oh, okay, how are we going to beat this? And then we felt like, yeah, we have to develop our own story. And it's also something that we always felt like there is the bigger scale, so to say, or the bigger tendencies in society, in spatial development. And we should understand them because then also we will probably be able to position ourselves better because we know, hey, it's going that direction. So for instance, with climate change, or we had at some point a topic about that we were just fascinated in a project about the dike system in a regional design project near Rotterdam. And we felt, hey, there should be some kind of research element to this. And then we went actually talking to a publisher and they were like, yeah, but you should make this much bigger. Why don't you look at the whole of the Netherlands? And then we felt like, yeah, that's crazy, but actually it's kind of cool. Let's try that and then get funding for that. Luckily, in the Netherlands, there is a bit of an infrastructure for that uh, in, in subsidies, but you have to convince them that you have a good idea, that you have co-funding, that you talk to some water boards, for instance, that are interested so that it has some kind of meaning that there's a collaboration with the university. So there's a lot of things that are, are added into that. But that was was not our first research project, but one of the major ones. We made a huge publication where it went international. That actually was one of our major successes in that field, where we also felt like it should be accessible to public as well. It should be interesting for decision makers. It should provide you with in-depth knowledge, but also in, a, in an accessible way with nice photography, nice infographics. And that's where we developed this approach uh, for, for that. Unfortunately, I have to say is that lately we really had to pull back again on the strategic department, so to say, of our office, because we also felt like we were for a long time more focused on projects that could get built. I think it also had to do with that there finally was a bit of time that it was easier to get into those kind of projects and getting stuff built, because at the point we were afraid to become some kind of paper architect or, or sort of indeed a bit of an urban planner rather than landscape architect being an architect, so to say. But it's also something we are very much known for, but we also do a lot of these projects that move towards realization and projects that are like really about master planning, which is, I think, something I also really enjoy, a kind of a bit of a world builder. You create uh, in 3D already a whole plan and then it's 
hopefully you will realize like that you collaborate with architects and with the city and with urban development. It's kind of, you know, everybody's attached to that and that's, it's also a nice way of working. So we want to be very versatile, but we do think the research feeds into the inspiration for the projects, like the big lines, the big stories. And the other way around, it's also that you get into research topics because you're confronted with them and you just have uh, a bit of a, an eureka moment like, hey, we should actually dive into this topic because this is new and this is, this is nice. And what's the, the portfolio of the office, but in terms of the, not the projects itself, but the kind of overall composition. So how big of a, of a chunk is actually the research projects and what are some of the other types of projects you work with and what are the, the things that actually bring money? So in other words, like what is a landscape office typically yeah. or specifically your office making money on? We actually did research that ourselves. In the beginning, we didn't really have a sharp eye to this, but the, gradually we, we went from very rough and now it's quite precise. So we categorize our projects, even though that always leads to discussions. But the research is definitely not the area which is the biggest moneymaker in, I think, any office. You also saw that in this crisis of 2008, which is already a while ago. So a lot of people probably have no idea what I'm talking about, but like say 50% of architects were without work. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it was more dramatic than most other especially the architects were hit hard and the building that's why also when we had to recover from it a lot of people left the profession so there was actually and we still feel it a shortage of people but research is normally not where the biggest funding goes to unless you're going for EU funding with a university there they're backing you up but then we are not maybe always the, the most interesting party because they, they don't see what we do actually we can do much more than most larger entities can do but then there's always the brand of science there like okay we did it scientifically or we took like 10 years to research it which i think is very valuable on its own but it, if you want to develop concepts and have new insights it goes sometimes a bit too slow so we do if we talk about research it's like design research but we want to do it in a thorough way i think most of the money comes from let's say feasibility studies master planning I kind of would also the regular work, which we don't shy away from. It's not that we want to be like an artsy office that is a bit disconnected from reality. At the same time, we also think there should always be a big landscape component in a project. Otherwise, we're also just point number 15 on the agenda of the project. And then, oh yeah, let's talk about the landscape now. And then everybody's already dozed off. So we want to be a little bit still, I guess, where we also maybe are a bit perhaps different from other offices. And I don't want to compare myself always, but it seems like we're always, landscape architects are always like the nice people who attach everything together and kind of make sure that the ugly parts of the building are not so visible or the project. That we are kind of, have a very humble job to do in these type of projects. But at the same time, I think we are quite assertive about it because we feel also there is, if you just talk about a little bit in commercial language, if you go to London, you see how they make all these skyscrapers and you look at the picture they put in front of the skyscraper. They show the rooftop garden. Green sells the project, especially when there's a lot of square meters being developed. And it's not always appreciated as such. If you look at budgets and look at, let's say, the, the status it has in the process of the project itself. So we always have a bit of a fight there and you have to be a little bit assertive because otherwise people just walk over you. At the same time, yeah, it doesn't make any sense to have some kind of fight over it. It's an area we also developed some expertise in. Uh, we also like this whole idea of a city having multiple levels that you can access as a pedestrian. The idea of having, let's yeah, say, bionic buildings, buildings that really live. A, a bit like a, a robot and a human merging together. I mean, in the end, a building is a kind of a, a stupid lump of metal and, and rock and glass and whatever. Like, it's, it's uh, not really smart, as it's put. would love to have a, an architect sitting next to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. I don't mind to tease them a little bit. It's, uh, I collaborate a lot with them, so, so they, they should be able to handle it. The other way around, they always like, yeah, 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 we still need a guy to uh, tell us where we have to put the trees. Yeah, we already designed the square and uh, we know where the parking is. So architects tend to have very controlling behavior, let's say. How do you fight for that not to happen? Because I think that over the years, and when I talk to a lot of people in the landscape architecture business and industry, in many countries, in Denmark, in Poland as well, they say that the role of landscape architect is increasing. 
How is that looking in uh, the Netherlands? I think in the Netherlands, it has been stronger compared at least to Poland. We also worked there in the past. In Denmark, I think they always had a very strong tradition. I also studied there and I lived there for like almost a year. And I was always admiring of the, let's say, the more geometric approach. But I felt like uh, the Netherlands, we are more maybe on the regional scale also, like especially the, where we started in Wageningen, it was mostly focused on, let's say, the rural side or the, let's say, provincial level compared to the city level, which I think they changed now because they have a different uh, professor there who is also very much engaged with the urban climate. So I think there's a lot of it is now coming from those kind of topics about, hey, we are now building cities which are unlivable or where nature has departed or where there's too much influence by, let's say, the developers or the architects compared to the holistic view towards the whole city, let's say, what, for instance, a municipality has. So I think a municipality like Amsterdam, they are very emancipated and almost they, they have such a list of demands towards the developers. And they still, I mean, everybody still makes a lot of money on it. So the municipality said, oh, okay, then we also want a little bit of that in the, having a nice project there and having eco-friendly project there like nature inclusive and to make sure that you deal with the water system properly and in i think in some countries that is not developed so strongly yet because it requires that you learn from past projects and maybe from other cities and sometimes the developer let's say power is stronger i'm not saying that they're like they're not like the evil that we have to fight it's not like that it's more there's always a bit of a, a forces that kind of kind of work into each other and then sometimes the one is more stronger than the other. And we're always a bit in between. Sometimes we're the diplomat and sometimes we're a little bit at war with everybody <laughs> or, or trying at least to, to defend the, the interests of the landscape. And I think indeed what you're saying, the role has become stronger. It doesn't always translate in a better position legally in contract, for instance, or in fee. I think that's really underappreciated for what we bring. Because a lot of what we bring is also in the, in the start of the project of defining what the project is about. Let's say we did a project here in Rotterdam called the Green Cape, the Groene Kaap. And we have an elevated set of roof gardens which are connected with bridges. So it f f works like a, a park, like from different buildings, people can walk onto the roof of the other building. And you can also access it from the street, ideally. They put a fence there now or a gate. But um, I'm just saying that is also a conceptual approach and where we collaborate a lot with architects. But if you then look at how the fee, for instance, is developed, then it's like, yeah, we look at how much concrete we're pouring and how much glass we're putting in there. And that's like, yeah, that's uh, 50 million. Yeah, well, how, what's the budget for the landscape? Yeah, it's 500,000. Oh yeah, so yeah, you get much less, of course. And, and that's not, you know, of course, there's also hours to be put in the building, but it's not always in, in proportion. And I also know architects can get squeezed by developers or they're not always also appreciated for their work. But that's a bit the struggle with landscape is that, uh, that sometimes, especially in this type of work, is that it's like, hey, the budget is less than what they earn on one apartment and you're building 500 of them. Shouldn't you spend a little bit more on the garden? And that also always relates to what we can earn. So it also the amount of time we can put into, the, the amount of technical development or design development we can put into. But I have to say that's, that's specifically for, let's say, the, what we then sometimes call developer projects. What we do in China, for instance, there we also have an office. And the interesting thing there is that they actually have developers for landscape. So they actually do park design like they would develop an urban uh, plot or urban block. Okay, so they have access to more money and, uh, and more power. They see, di they see landscape architecture in a different position. It's about 4,000 years ago, they actually kind of invented landscape architecture. Then the Japanese uh, took inspiration from it and that we know it as a Japanese style. And then the English copied it, and then, and then it was the English landscape style. I'm, I'm kind of going really roughly through history. But you could say that they have a tradition in that sense. And I know there's a lot of like, uh, criticism towards sometimes how the Chinese market works, or how they do projects, or how they, they, they deal with society. But I think this part they have right. They invest in the green first, and then they actually develop the buildings later, to put it simply. Because they say, like, if we have a nice park, then, you know, everybody wants to live there. Also because of the size and the scale of the speed they're operating, they, they want to make that a, a sort of an integrated approach. At least for us, it's, it's very interesting. And we sort of hit it off there with, with the first project, and then we got another project. And that's actually a skill that we don't work in, in the Netherlands so much. Sometimes in Europe, 
but that you have like 12 kilometers of boulevard to design or, or park to design. It's very rare here. I guess the thing is more that I think the status has very much improved. I think it doesn't always show in, let's say, the credits or appreciation, but I don't want to come across as something who doesn't appreciate, the, let's say, the credits that we get. There's always a lot of attention that really goes out to the iconic building. But what might be the case is that, let's say, the new icon of the new age is not a building. It's actually a public space. Yeah, or a park. A park, a street. It's also a bit like the community space, the, where people meet, where they actually can form the city for themselves temporarily by meeting each other, by having an event. But these spaces has become more important in a way, and I think also for how people perceive cities. Take the High Line in, in New York. There was at some point actually an icon as a park and in the city of skyscrapers, where maybe people also got maybe a little bit bored with skyscrapers being iconic. So yeah. like, hey, the park is the new icon. I think that might be the, the case. And I really like what you said, that probably the new icons, the new attractors of cities, it will be on the ground. It will be the public spaces. Or against, you know, it can be sloping on a building. It can be on a plus one. I think the new cities will have multi-levels, eh? like Singapore. There's already some modern cities because they don't have the space. They have to start using the other spaces. And, and I think the Netherlands has a kind of a specific situation I think is kind of unique compared to, for instance, the crown countries, at least Germany, is that they have still plans or let's say predictions, I have to say, so, so projections, that we will have even another, let's say, three, two to three million people moving here, or let's say at least the population will increase. And we keep on building. And, and that's one of the like, bigger issues now also in, in let's say, politics, like uh, how to what extent do we want to accommodate that? But our cities will become denser. They are more vertical. What is happening in Rotterdam will happen in other cities as well. Whereas the periphery now, it might be more central even. So, and you can't imagine because we're already with so many people here, you know? Although I need to say that Amsterdam is going beyond that because I feel like it's, it's extremely tall. Like all the buildings around, especially when you are going to here and you are going from the main train station and you are approaching the, the harbor, it's extremely tall. I mean, they are... In Rotterdam, you mean? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, like yeah. The, the skyscrapers are everywhere and it's, uh, it is really overwhelming, especially coming from Copenhagen. It's uh, Manhattan at the Muse. <laughs> that's how they call it. <laughs> that uh, looks like that. Yeah, and that's also a bit the history of Rotterdam. It was bombed by the, by the Germans and then it was rebuilt already during the war. They were making plans and we had this modernist harbor uh, barons that were called like sort of rich local uh, people that said, we have to build a city in, in the modernist style that was influenced from New York and, and Manhattan, but also, I think, from actually from German modernism. As a history lesson, I'm just trying to say is that and we never stopped with that. We're still rebuilding the city, but actually we're now expanding on it. There's also been a bit, big debate in Rotterdam about that there was maybe a bit too much attention for towers and not enough for the streets in between the towers, the space between the buildings. And then they invited young Gail here who actually gave a lot of advice on it. Also because Rotterdam was very much a car city and they wanted to make it more pedestrian friendly. We have a bit of an ambiguous thought on it because I also kind of like the fact that it's lively. I mean, cars also, yeah, you can hate them, but they also bring liveliness in a certain way. That's an interesting way to put it. I don't know if Jan Gehl would agree with that. He doesn't, completely <laughs> not. But let's say it's not that we want to have the whole city to be some kind of shopping street. That's more my point. Like I think it's good to, and he doesn't want that either, but it's more like, I think that the gestures that they're doing are very good. I really support the municipality in, in their approach now. Like one of the coolest streets in Rotterdam is the Witte de Wit street, which is also cool because there's these guys, mostly guys, driving around in their, uh, on a nice day with their cabriolet or their <laughs> expensive Mercedes uh, showing off, even though it's also dangerous and annoying for the people who sit there. But it's also like, it's the kind of liveliness that you don't find anywhere else. But this street has also bike lanes, which is important, like uh, both sides and the uh, sidewalks are okay, white. And I think it's also the restaurants that, that bring the life. I really like this street. There is the greenery as well. I think that dimensions are pretty well done if it comes to the human scale. But yeah, great that we touched upon uh, Rotterdam because I think that I can relate more to that now uh, while being here for, for a couple of days already. Also, there's one more thing about the projects that I wanted to talk. You do some projects in Rotterdam. So you influence the city as well. But talking about the role of, of architects or landscape architects, 
You've mentioned that uh, sometimes the budget might be extremely low. So you might have 50 million euro, let's say, for the building and 500,000 euro for the landscape. Are you in the position to refuse some of that project or the other way you would, you would like to work on those projects because it's such a great challenge? Yeah, well, one of the first things we do is, is ask about the budget when they approach us, of course. And I have to say, we started out with, uh, when our office were, everything was low budget. So we're used to, we, we are also not saying, we are not, let's say, arrogant about like, okay, we, we are not uh, getting out of bed uh, for less than that or something, you know, that we have some figure in mind. You are not doing that. No, we are actually, we, we are kind of open there, but we also feel, that's also because sometimes you have idealistic projects. And we have one now, also the budget is really low. They said, okay, for the fee for you, it doesn't really matter. So it really depends also on the purpose of the project. And I think when it comes to like commercial projects where a developer has an ambition, they should show it also in how much they are prepared to invest in the landscape. Because you also said one has to be assertive. Yes. So then we are assertive. So if they then say, yeah, 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 yeah maybe it's 100 euro per square meter. We're like, yeah, come on, guys. That's uh, 1999. I mean, it's uh, 2024 now. Uh, <laughs> please make a new calculation. Because a lot of times the developers have no clue themselves or they, they sort of make a budget there, but they never really did a, a proper area calculation. So there's always, they start thinking again only when you uh, come in and they hired you, you know? So, or you're normally there's like you and two other officers and then they pick one. So the thing is also, yeah, you can start very arrogantly and then they probably won't hire you. I mean, it's, it's also not like our, our style, let's say. But I do think to be assertive is more about making sure that you have create conditions for yourself to make something that is also something you can be proud of that actually will work for the clients. And again, what usually also happens is that there is a, well, that's indeed in a Dutch context, that, that a lot of developers have a conceptual group and then they have their like builders group. And then there's a separation between the two. And then we are sometimes continuing and then with the other group when they start building. And they look again, and then they're like, yeah, yeah, but I looked at my Excel sheet, and uh, I asked this guy, he said it can be a half the price. You know, they, it's kind of a moment where I think consciously they just will attack your design again, saying, uh, okay, can we kick out half? And the problem is, and that's what my point was a bit with the legal position of landscape architects, if you see what kind of contracts we sometimes get, it's really to cry for. You know, they, what they take as exemptions on, let's say, the general way of working, like we have conditions that are agreed upon, that are industry standards, so to say, and they just take everything out from copyright to whatever, you know, and then you have to negotiate those things back in. That's, let's say, the game. And then halfway the projects, you, of course, I mean, it all works out and nobody wants to kind of go ugly there with the contracts. But if something could happen, they always have the power over you to basically kick you out anytime they want and hire somebody else or the garden, call this uh, builder, the people who actually, uh, the horticulturist, to actually then finish it off I mean, and it's also sometimes I'm fine with, you know, having a more modest role if there's not so many, for instance, not a budget, but rather we stay on board and they just call us when there's an issue, even if the budget is low and they're like, yeah, shit, uh, we have this garbage containers, we have to put them somewhere. They came in later and we are not involved anymore. I mean, an architect will always demand they will be involved until the very end, but it's nothing written in stone. There's nothing in the German system, for instance, it's much more prescribed. We used to have something like that, and they just got rid of it in this building crisis I was mentioning. And since then, it's more like free market. A lot of these developers, they don't realize that they're actually shooting in their own foot with this. You know, I mean, we are relatively cheap for the size of the project, and we are totally engaged with it. So in my thinking, and maybe, maybe developers also listen to this uh, podcast, I do hope so, that it's actually smarter to have your landscape architect on board to the end and it's not where you can really save money because they're always afraid yeah then it's expensive yeah, we spend another 10,000 euros there and you're like come on I don't want to make it too cynical but of course their main purpose is in a way to maximize their profit nine of ten times they're not going to live there themselves Going back to the beginning and also what you said, I hope that uh, some developers are listening. I know that some of the representatives of the cities in many countries are listening. But I also know that young landscape architects are listening, students perhaps as well. That's why I would like to ask you uh, towards the end for some advice. What would be 
some sort of hint or tips for the young people out there starting in the profession? I guess, you know, the, the Dutch market, the best. So maybe drawing some lessons from here, if you could share that. I really try at the start to say a little bit how we developed ourselves. And, and we did it the hard way, in a way. So we made all of our mistakes at our own expense. So I do think it can help to get some experience, a little bit of network in an established office or in a maybe different kind of environment. We kind of knew already, I think I can really say that with hindsight, that during our studies, we wanted to have our own office. We wanted to be our own boss. We didn't want somebody else telling us what to do. That was kind of when we were young, like this was important to us. Now I also think like, yeah, you're always in collaborations where somebody has maybe uh, power over you in the sense of making decisions. And a lot of it is very collaborative on what you do. But I think one of the things to really try to do at the start is to work on your own narrative of why, why, what is the purpose of your office. I find that really the hardest part because in a way, every landscape architecture office, they will have a similar purpose. Eh? We all want to make this, the world more beautiful, to plant more trees, to create nice spaces in the city. So how do you distinguish yourself from that? But that's an important question. Another thing is, I would say, I think we were very impatient, which also was a good driver for us. But things will come in the end, let's say. Sometimes you're lucky with, let's say, the economy where you're in. That's very important, the economy. In the end, you need those developers to give you commission. So maybe I was not being very diplomatic now to them, but let's say it's still something that there is, you know, know your client base. There are municipalities, there are developers but also maybe uh, institutional clients, like we worked for Adidas, for instance. They are not a developer, but they have then a department. But I think it's good that you just have to go probably from smaller to bigger projects. But, you know, the office I admired the most, like, for instance, like Plot at the time, which was Bjarke Engels and Julien de Smet. The way they started, it was like also like, like a whirlwind. So I think there's different ways of starting. They, they grew very fast in a short time, but then they also decided to break up. I think that was kind of sad. I think it is also, there's not like one way of dealing with it. And it's very good to understand your own ambitions. Well, like, do you want to have like a smaller office and you just want to have a kind of more quiet life? Or I, I don't mean it in a bad way, but more like you're like locally rooted and you have your network there. We kind of did a bit of a different approach where we tried to kind of connect all over the world. And it worked out very well for us because also Rotterdam is an international city. So sometimes people work here for a while. They move back to Italy or to Scandinavia, and then later they call you like, hey, we had this great collaboration. Yeah, we now have a project here. You want to hang out with us, do this project? So I guess that network is also something that, you know, you can put energy there, but it also happen a little bit to you. So I wouldn't worry too much about those kind of things. It's mainly like getting a little bit your, your purpose right. Like, why am I here on earth? Huh? What am I doing? Why am I taking this profession? I, actually, I'm, why am I so crazy to start my own office? And then, yeah, you're kind of dependent on, on the economic conditions. So for us, it just took longer, I guess, because we went like first five years through bas basically a dead economy. And then it sort of picked up, but it also gave us time to really mature, make a lot of mistakes and learn from them. So I think those are like important things. Like there's things you can influence. It's very like stoic that you should focus on those things you can influence and accept the things you cannot. If a jury doesn't like your plan, yeah, you could say, oh, that's my mistake. It's my plan was terrible. But you can also think, yeah, I kind of liked it, you know? So think about, are you happy when you send it out? Like before the jury actually says something about it. You can be like in fifth place or in tenth place and say, yeah, but we still had the best plan. So so be a little bit confident there. And, and, and I think that's already hard with all the judging going on and, and all the competitions and the pitching. That's been a, a big piece uh, of advice. So good luck to all of you incorporating that into your own career. Yeah, and please start <laughs> offices. I think it's important people do that. I always really like it also when people work and saying, hey, I'm going to quit Lola because I want to start my own office. I'm like, yeah, sure. Great. You know, good for you. Of course, sometimes sad to see, see somebody go that you really uh, enjoyed having around. It's a good ambition to have. And also, yeah, maybe it doesn't go. We, we went straight out of graduation, more or less. Some people wait another five years or 10 years. If you want to do this when you're already like in my age now and you have kids and whatever, it's maybe more difficult than, than when you uh, are still young, but it's, it, you can do it at any moment. Especially that those people who uh, leave the office to create something on, on their own, they, they might still come back as collaborators or still be the part of the network, as you said, and bring projects and bring, bring opportunities. Case that 
the last thing is also on the inspiration because I would love to ask you for a book recommendation. I have a kind of a lot of books that I like and also that kind of changes over time. But one of my favorite books is Design with Nature by Ian McHark, which is a classic. He is one of the inventors of GIS and overlaying so that you basically make analysis of a, of a certain area and then all the characteristics and then try to draw conclusions from that. Something we now do a lot actually in 3D or 2D with climate tests of sites, like you want to know the wind conditions, you want to know the sun conditions. And he was uh, one of the founders of that, but actually also he, he knew a lot about how landscapes actually emerge. So he, in his book, he has, has a very nice chapter on the Dutch dune system, which actually made me understand it much better than how I got it myself from other books. And he, uh, he's an American, so I thought it was quite amazing. But how actually uh, dunes develop over time and stabilize themselves. And also learning a bit that, that landscape is not a static thing, that is always changing. So I think it's nice to read. It's a classic book. And there's also a lot of other books I really like on landscape detailing, etc. But I mean, we're now in our library here. <laughs> so uh, There is a lot. There is like the, yeah. 200 books. Yeah, <laughs> that's one side. And then we have more here. And 100 more on the other side. So, so that's a lot. We have internet, but we still like to use our book and have more in-depth uh, knowledge on it. Thank you for the recommendation and for inviting me here to Lola. You're welcome. And yeah, for being part of this series and also bringing this uh, Dutch perspective because so far I've been very Danish or Copenhagen centric. And I think that the Dutch perspective is extremely crucial. So I, I hope to bring even more of that. But I'm very happy that I started with you and, uh, and Lola. That's been a, a pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Welcome to the Netherlands, which is kind of like Denmark on steroids. <laughs> especially Rotterdam thank you for listening to the newest episode with Case and as you maybe have heard at the beginning of the conversation that was actually our second time when we met because first we recorded our discussion online but then I realized that I will be physically in Rotterdam so we met again with Case and this time recorded physically in the very nice office of Lola I hope you enjoyed this discussion and if you would like to share it with your landscape architect colleagues or, or friends, it would be amazing. And also, if you have any ideas for more guests in the series, let me know. That was the last episode of the series so far before the summer break. And I will talk to you soon. And I will be back also with the series in September. Have a great summer. <laughs>